I've realized that among the Nordic speakers, I seem to be the only continental European one. Uh, that's probably because we are so concerned with uh, long haul flights in these days and uh, traveling just for two days is kind of on the edge. But Alan, to be here and present a talk at the occasion of your 60th birthday is worth the travel. So I stole a little bit the title from one of your papers, Beyond Universality, was um, um, about, I, I think, six years ago, a paper with, um, in which you wrote with Alice and Sandrine. And um, so I will put it a little bit to the extreme. And since a lot of people are here um, doing linear algebra, numeric linear algebra, or linear algebra in whatever fashion, um, let me show you this formula here of an expansion coefficient in a certain uh, probability distribution. And those polynomials here, the factors, polynomial factors, were obtained by solving an overdetermined 125 by 12 system over the ring of rational polynomials. And I will um, point a little bit into that mystery in a while. So um, I had the privilege to uh, be in Paris with you at the occasion of your 60th birthday at the very at the spot. And here you see where some uh, table fireworks um, were put uh, to, to celebrate that. And I did the same exercise as um, um, uh, other speakers to just collect where did we meet before. And I think this list is pretty comprehensive. And it starts with the Arbel Symposium in Orlesund in 2006, which, which is remarkable for two facts. First of all, I was still working in American PDEs, in the random matrices. And you were in your pre-Julia uh, phase. And you gave an impromptu lecture at that occasion about parallel MATLAB. It's from a different age. Um, and um, all the other meetings here um, are um, connected to random matrices or to Nick Trefessen. So this one is in the future. In August, we will meet again in Oxford. I like the future proof of your talk. Pardon me? <laughs> you talk about future proof. Yeah, absolutely. And Paris somewhat put us together. We have met there four times. OK, so now let's talk about um, universality in random metric theory and beyond. So uh, many interesting things come up if you look at limit laws in probability. Um, everybody of here knows the central limit law. Um, so you rescale um, random variables, and then in the limit you get some distribution. And in random matrix theory, it's typically not the normal distribution, but some kind of tracy Witten distributions or um, other distributions. And sometimes you are always uh, you are also putting convergent rates to your um, um, limit laws, and it happens that in many cases in random matrix theory, those limit laws and the order happens to be universal. So independently from uh, the microstructure, uh, those limit laws and orders only depend on the underlying symmetry class. But then people are, have also started to look into expansions. So you try to expand in powers of those scaling variables h and uh, calculate those um, coefficient functions here. And those coefficient functions then are non-universal. And in most cases, people only have looked at the first order correction, uh, which is then called um, finite size correction in, in, in the more mathematical physics oriented literature. However, if you look at specific probability distributions, this is one from combinatorics. You are looking at the longest increasing subsequences in fixed point free random involutions. 
then you see if you do a histogram of the true probability, discrete probability distribution and compare it with the limit law, the limit law is the dotted line here, then you see this dotted line is not particularly accurate. And um, then you can talk about um, doing an asymptotic expansion and in that case I uh, did this uh, uh, this year and calculated first, second, and third order correction terms. And if you do the first two correction terms, then you get a perfect match to that uh, discrete probability distribution. If you look for the error and com compare with the third order, um, then you see that those data points for various sizes of the underlying um, uh, permutations, you get a perfect uh, visual agreement with the computed third order correction term. Those scaled probability distributions at random metric theory, random permutations, <laughs> random combinatorial structures can often be expressed in terms of Fretton determinants. And then you are up to um, the developing into an exp uh, asymptotic expansion such a parameter dependent Fretton determinant. And the typical way of doing it is you expand the kernel itself and lift that kernel expansion to um, get the expansion of the determinant. And if you look for the first three terms, then you see it's an highly nonlinear structure you get. You get polynomials of the um, operators here, those uh, scaled uh, operators coming from those um, kernels. Um, you're scaling by the resolvent of the uh, limit law. And then you get um, in those non-commutative things um, polynomials and you're tra uh, taking traces and you um, get polynomials of those traces. Okay, so it's a highly nonlinear structure. However, you can do calculations. Uh, that is what brought me into the business of uh, uh, random metric theory and beyond by um, developing a toolbox to get highly accurate um, calculations of those um, Fretton determinants and um, operator traces. And you can express those functions in a fairly um, symbolic way. Uh, here you see those G entries here from the um, um, expansion of the lifting of the uh, kernel to the determinants. And here you see, uh, in a typical case, uh, the expansion of the kernel. Okay, and then you can uh, calculate the value of those functions g just by um, having an interface to the numerical method. And using that numerical evaluation, you could do those plots here. No problem. However, from an analytics uh, point of view, those Highly nonlinear expansion terms in terms of uh, traces of, of polynomials of resolvents and so on are not very appealing, and you don't see much about the underlying analytic structure. So it came as a very surprise to me that if, when I played a little bit more with those things, um, that I discovered a certain structure and. This structure is a kind of integrability. Um, I want to recall uh, Flaschke's definition of integrability, which McKean called the only honest one around. Integrability in the theory of nonlinear PDEs that you can basically solve the problem by inverse scattering or other methods, okay? And he defined integrability or solvability in that context as you didn't think I could integrate that, but I can. And um, here you have to see 
who is speaking? For me, the computer is speaking. The computer is telling me, oh, I can integrate that. And you didn't think I can do it. Um, what I observed in smaller examples to begin with, that in all the cases I looked at in probability, uh, in, in the random matrix theory, in random um, permutations, random involutions, and so on, the, if the limit law is a trace evident for one of the integrable beaters, one, two, or four, those expansion coefficients always take the form to be a linear combination up to order 2j of the higher order derivatives of the limit law with polynomial, rational polynomial coefficients. And you can prove this by inspection of concrete cases in the beta equals 2 case. Then I took the sparsity structure of those polynomials and by doing the calculation, the numerical calculation of those operator traces on the one hand side and on of the derivatives of the poly, um, trace evident distribution on the other hand side, I could calculate the rational coefficients of those polynomials simply by doing numerics and then rational reconstruction. And the rational numbers looked similar to the beta equals two case. And then later I realized that in the beta equals one and four case, I can also use the certain factorization of the beta equals two case to get to those coefficients in a symbolic way. However, I have to assume that structure here you know, to make it possible. But then I can take those calculations and compare them numerically to the functions in terms of the um, uh, numerics of the uh, operator determinants, and I see it works. Um, it's a basic miracle. And even in the case beta equals 2, where you can do all those calculations exactly, it's a kind of miracle that this linear structure here, this multilinear structure, pops out for the highly nonlinear. <laughs> expansion. Let me start with the beta equals 2 case to give you a little bit of the flavor of what's going on. If you do the perturbations of the error kernel determinant, you see that the expansion coefficients are always of the form being the trace evident distribution times a Q linear combination of certain minors of an infinite matrix. And the entries of that infinite matrix where we um, do those minors are given by traces of rank one operators. Okay, it's the resolvent of the uh, error kernel um, operator times a tensor product between the J's derivative of the error function and the case one. And that's an rank one operator, okay? And um, the every kernel itself is certainly not of rank one, okay? Already this structure of the um, expansion is kind of a miracle. I could only prove this up to n smaller equal 100 by inspection. If you're doing inspection on a computer, you have to stop somewhere. And I stopped arbitrarily at 100. Okay. And there is a um, Chinese postdoc working at Fohan University. She told me that by using Riemann Hilbert techniques, you can skip that and um, below 100 and get that algebraic structure in general. So now. <coughs> Gino and Tracy in 2011, they published a table. A table of those F2 times UJK for J plus K smaller than eight. And they had all in all entries in the table, 
the structure rational polynomial times higher order derivatives of the Tracy Widom distribution. Here you see it for the case U30. Okay, a specific such linear combination of higher order derivatives. They didn't write up a method underlying that table. They only wrote um, a method how to prove every in entry of that table. And I contacted uh, Craig Tracy, how he, they did it, and um, he told me, oh, it's too long ago, I don't know, and she know, has left the area, so um, I didn't have anything to extend that table or to understand the underlying method. So I kind of reverse engineered that table and tried to extend it to the minors I had in my expansions. So let's go back to the Tracy Widom theory. You take it specific, and it isn't important what specific solution of Panglevy to. The only thing which is important here is that the second derivative is a linear combination with polynomial coefficients, rational polynomials, of the Q and powers of Q. And the logarithmic derivative of the Tracy Widom distribution, which happens to be U0, is also a polynomial of Q prime of Q with uh, rational polynomials and T as coefficients. And now the theory of Pongleby 2 is telling you Q and Q prime, if Q is not the trivial solution, are algebraic independent on QT. And this gives you that recursively the Ernst derivative of the Tracy Widom divided by F2 belongs to that polynomial space, which is closed under differentiation because of the Pongleby 2. Whenever you get a second derivative, you can express it in, the, in terms of the zero and the first. Okay, so it's a polynomial space closed under differentiation. Now, if you believe in the linear form structure of the table of Tracy and, uh, of Chino and Tracy and both conjectured in that paper that that structure holds generally, if this linear form structure holds generally, then those uj, k must belong to that polynomial space. Okay, and one can see there is a kind of underlying recursion up to in differentiation it looks like that you can recursively at least put the derivative into that polynomial space. Okay? So, what we have is if certain entries of my infinite matrix belong to that polynomial space, then I get that the derivative of the UJK belongs to that polynomial space. And this suggests a recursive algorithm for computing that. So you make the ansatz, which would be on the right-hand side in the polynomial space. If the ansatz is true, it forces your ujk into that polynomial space. You did take the derivative of that ansatz, which gives you <coughs> Since you already know that the derivatives are recursively seen in the polynomial space, a linear system of size, if you do the algebra 2n squared plus 1 times 2n, for the polynomials and their derivatives being a solution in Q, uh, t, the, the ring of polynomials to the power 2n. So I solved this overdetermined linear system with arbitrary solution places here to speak, R1 to Rn, in the second half of the unknowns. If it would be not solvable, then my conjecture is wrong and I have to break. If I get a solution, 
which by the algebraic independence then must be a unique solution, then I have to check that in the second half of those slots, I get the derivatives of the first half. And if this is also miraculously the case, then I have put ujk into the space and then can proceed. Okay, and this I have done until j plus k equals 50, I have to stop somewhere. I mean, the computer has to be useful for other things. But I believe it's true in general. And I mean, if I have a spare computer, I probably could run it for one year, two years, and three years, and it would still pop out a larger and larger table. But this is not a proof that it holds generally. So if you do this algorithm to the U30 from the table of Tracy Wooden that I have shown you, then you get a 33 by 8 system. I show here only the middle 13 um, row, uh, rows. And you get a unique solution. And if you take the derivatives of the first four entries, you get the second four entries. OK, so it's a valid solution. And it reproduces Tracy and Shino uh, and Tracy's entry in the table. So this is for the UJ case. And now I have to go for the minus. So if you believe that the UJ case belongs to the polynomial space, and I've checked this up to J plus K equals 50, then the minus with coefficients belonging to the checked ones would belong to that space. Determinants are are still living in that polynomial space, okay? I do the ansatz. Now I don't have to differentiate anymore because I know it's in that space. I set up the system by comparing coefficients in this respect to um, the set of um, rational polynomials. And this gives me, again, an overdetermined system which I have to solve for those unknown polynomials. And if it is solvable by the algebraic independence, it must be a unique solution. And if it is not solvable, then I would have to uh, quit my conjecture about the general structure, but I haven't seen any hint in that direction. All the examples I did were of that system. Now, if you take the simple minor for my infinite symmetric matrix, this is this two by two determinant. I would have to solve a 28 by four system and I get a unique solution in the ring of rational polynomials and I get this expression. This is kind of miraculous. I see no reason why it should be that way. Um, that those overdetermined systems all always popping up uh, that structure. And this only holds for the minors. If you go for those terms here, or this term, you wouldn't get a solution. So it's not for general nonlinear polynomials, it's just for the minors that this works. And um, why do I care for the uh, observed multilinear structure rational polynomials times higher order derivatives of the limit law? Because it allows me very simply to, to get, uh, for instance, an expansion of the mean. If you look at the longest increasing subsequence problem for random permutations, this was a problem um, um, posed by uh, Stanislav Ulam, then you see the following development. If you take the leading order of that expected value of, the, um, of that length, it was shown in 77 to be 2 square root of n. The first correction term was famously given by Baik, Dijf, and Johansson about 22 years later. And now, again, 
about a little bit more than 20 years later, I added the rest. And here you see for the first coefficients, you always get a Q-linear form of the higher order moments of the limit law. Because the higher order derivatives can be pushed to the polynomials, okay? If you, um, therefore, if I um, take the moments of those higher order derivatives by partial integration, I just get higher powers of t. So this is the structure. And as long as I believe in my um, structure being a linear combination of rational uh, polynomials times the um, higher order derivatives, that structure will hold true here, okay? And then by just computing the higher order moments of the Tracy Witten distribution, you can get highly accurate numerical values. Okay, so computational tricks might be theoretical tricks. This is one of the headlines of this workshop here. So let me shortly talk about tricks. The computational trick is here using linear equations in this um, polynomial space of uh, rational polynomials adjoined with the, the Q and Q prime from the Pongliwe 2 equation. It reveals a specific structure for all cases inspected. But I have to expect, inspect every single case, okay? And I have to stop at some point. I cannot do it forever. There is a clear general conjecture coming from it, and I believe it's true. There is no reason that those overdetermined systems just by contingency should be uniquely solvable. There must be some underlying reason. So uh, in effect, for me, the conjecture has been given the stamp of incontestability. Dispute other things. This is immovable. This is a, a citation from Wittgenstein's uncertainty. So in a certain sense, I'm, I'm certain this conjecture is true. The theoretical trick, which could give us the proof, the explanation, is still unknown. So the theoretical trick might allow us to prove the general conjecture. The proof is not the essential thing here for me. The essential thing, more important, is I would like to understand that miracle. I do not understand it. And solving just one linear system after the other and always getting a unique solution for those overdetermined systems points me there must be a theoretical structure, but it's not giving any explanation. I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Are there any questions? I had one. So the... Um, Do you want to go through your bubble? So just want to make sure that I understand the, the scope of this. This would apply any time the finite airy kernel is kind of describing the exact distribution? So if the limit law is one of the uh, Tracy Witten distributions, beta equals one, two, or four, then I observe in many, many different models this structure, be it the uh, um, large matrix limit at the hard edge, be it uh, um, some combinatorial problems. I even have talked to uh, Herbert Stone and certain instances of the KPZ equation of the polynuclear growth models and so on. You always observe that structure now. Uh, so this seems to be pretty universal in a sense for, for those models. Um, but no reason. <laughs>